I think we're about to begin. The audience, good morning and welcome. Uh, good morning in, in California and good afternoon in the East Coast. And for those of you who stayed awake in Europe, thank you very much, everyone, for taking your valuable time to attend this very special webinar. I'm Bart Ziegler, president of the Samuel Lawrence Foundation. Today, we have the distinct privilege and honor of hearing from two extraordinary experts on the nuclear waste issue. Recent events in Ukraine with the militarization of the radioactive waste shows that it certainly to be, it's certainly one of the most pressing issue, global issues of our time. Okay, let's all welcome the investigative journalist, Joshua Frank, author of Atomic Days and the Untold Story of the Most Toxic Place in America. Now I'll turn the microphone over to Dr. Peter Anderson, a world-renowned communications expert, author, research scientist, member of Sierra Club's executive committee who helped write, and he helped write their 140-page nuclear waste policy. And finally, moderator for today's webinar. Without further ado, thank you, Dr. Peter Anderson. All right, pleasure to be here. Uh my video is not yet enabled, but I'm going to proceed anyway. We're delighted to have uh, Joshua Frank, uh, who originally was from Montana. He's an American investigative journalist, and he covers political and environmental topics. His work has been honored by the Society of Professional Journalists. He's won numerous awards, and uh, he's just written his fifth book. And that's the one we're going to talk about today. Atomic Days, the untold story of the most toxic place in America, and that is the Hanford uh, nuclear waste site. So, Josh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Why should people in the West be concerned about Hanford? Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. Really honored to be here in the Samuel Lawrence Foundation and everybody tuning in. Um, it's really great to spend a a Friday uh, morning with everybody on Cinco de Mayo. Um, so to answer your question, you know, so I don't know what everybody knows about Hanford. Um, I will say, oh, here it looks like we can start a video. Yeah. So I'm Peter there Anderson, we go. and this is Bart and Joshua. Hey, good to see everybody. Um, so, you know, Hanford is a very complicated saga. I think in order to really kind of understand where we're at today with it and why everybody should be concerned about it, we need to understand how it got to where it's at now. Um, Hanford was one of the three locations chosen during the Manhattan Project. Um, each, each different site was chosen for a different purpose. Hanford was chosen for, uh, to produce plutonium for atomic weapons, which it did uh, for a long, long time. Um, that process began, you know, way back at the <laughs> World War II days, right? Um, Hanford is located in eastern Washington state. It is sort of out of sight, out of mind for a lot of people that live in sort of the more urban areas of Seattle, Portland. Um, but it's located uh, near the Tri-Cities areas, which is Richland is right next to Hanford, right along the Columbia River. Beautiful, beautiful area, uh, not far from Walla Walla, Washington. Um, one of the best wine growing regions in the Northwest. Um, it's a really beautiful landscape and, the Han and, and Hanford is smack dab right in the middle of this place. And, and Hanford, uh, just to give you a kind of a perspective of like how big this place is, you know, it's a 586 square mile region. Um, it was chosen because of its remoteness. Um, it was also chosen because it had access to water. Um, the nuclear reactors that were built along the Columbia that produced plutonium, they needed to have access to clean water so and cold water. So the Columbia was perfect for that. It also, they also needed to have constant electricity, uh, which is produced from the dams on the Columbia. So it was kind of this perfect marriage for, at least in the minds of those of the Manhattan Project, to create this uh, atomic beast, essentially. Um, and it was you know, for decades producing plutonium. Um, and a lot of people didn't even know what it was really doing. I mean, you could, workers that worked at Hanford might live next to, <laughs> their neighbor might work at Hanford, but they, they didn't share information. They didn't even know what the other, what their neighbors were working on. I mean, this was a very covert military operation for, for decades. Um, and just to fast forward, 
And during that time, uh, Hanford produced literally millions of gallons of chemical waste, millions of gallons of radioactive waste, and the quest to produce atomic bombs and to fuel those for fuel for those atomic bombs really superseded the importance of storing this waste properly. Um, so today, what we're dealing with at Hanford is what's left over from this whole atomic operation, right? Uh, we're dealing with um, a huge, huge, huge amount of radioactive waste that's sitting out there in these tanks. Uh, Hanford has two thirds of all high level radioactive waste in the country. Um, it's stored in 177 huge underground tanks. Um, I think 149 of those tanks are single shelled tanks. The rest are double shelled. Um, and those tanks were really only supposed to last a few decades. We're going on 80 years now. So it's a big, big problem. I mean, even at the onset of uh, the project itself, engineers and scientists were very concerned in issuing warnings and reports about this isn't a good way to store this stuff. Uh, it's going to create a lot of problems down the road. Um, you know, radioactive waste, plutonium in particular, it's virulent for 250,000 years. So this is a problem that's going to far outlive these tanks. And they were worried about it, you know, in the 50s and 60s. Well, now fast forward to 2030 or 2023, and they're looking into the future now. Uh, they still haven't done anything with this waste. They've emptied some of these tanks. But right now, uh, most of that waste is still sitting right where it's always been. Um, Hanford was producing plutonium up until the late 80s, the end of the Cold War, and almost overnight became a massive cleanup project. Um, and I want to sort of buffer that. Uh, <laughs> cleanup is sort of like this idea that, oh, it's going to just be completely remediated and safe forever and no, no problems, right? Well, that's not really the case. Uh, I guess when I use the word cleanup or the term cleanup, I'm really just talking about trying to keep this stuff safe so that we aren't on the verge of a, a, you know, an atomic explosion, which is quite likely if we don't take care of this. Um, so right now there are two of these tanks that are leaking. Um, the Department of Energy, which oversees the project, uh, they're really um, controlled by the contractors. Uh, so the Department of Energy hires these contractors that are doing all the dirty work, right? They're the, they're the ones on the ground. They're the ones building these facilities. Uh, the big one out there is Bechtel. Bechtel has a horrible track record. Um, numerous reports have by the, the Government Accountability Office have said, these guys are not doing a good job. They're wasting money. They're booking taxpayers um, to the tune of billions of dollars. I mean, the, the price tag for this thing right now is $677 billion. It's really astronomical. Um, just five years ago, it was 300 billion. I think by the end, by 2030, we're looking at it. I bet it's gonna be over a trillion dollars. Um, and it's just, it's absolutely insane how much profit's going on, yet very, very little work is being done. Um, one of the big facilities is called the waste, waste treatment plant. And the idea is to get this waste out of these tanks and vitrify it and turn it into glass and store it safely, right? Well, <laughs> if you were to read the, read the press releases and I have back in the nineties when they were talking about this, uh, they should have been done about 20 years ago with this. Well, they haven't vitrified anything at Hanford. Um, and we're, you know, now going on 40 years later or and 30, 35 years later. So it's just a crazy situation. Um, and these two tanks that are leaking right now uh, pose a really great danger to the Columbia River. So these tanks are only about seven miles, some of them from the Columbia River. And there's groundwater that goes underneath these tanks that feed the Columbia River. Well, uh, the longer this waste continues to leach into the soil and make its way to the groundwater supply, it will eventually make its way to the, the Columbia River. Um, we know over the course of Hanford's lifespan, while it was in operation, uh, there were 67 leaks from these tanks. These tanks are in horrible, horrible shape. Um, and I, I explore a lot of that in the, in the book. Um, I interview a couple whistleblowers, one in particular, Donald Alexander. Uh, he's a, a PhD um, and he works for the, worked for the Par Department of Energy. He's now retired. Uh, one of his big concerns was that these tanks could explode. 
Um, so these tanks that have a lot of this horrible, highly radioactive waste in there are, are literally bubbling, right? They're creating heat. Um, they constantly have to be kept cool some, in some cases, and they're off putting gases, in this case, hydrogen. And hydrogen is very, very flammable. Um, and if there were to be a, a buildup of hydrogen that, you know, a spark ignited it, you could see a horrible, horrible explosion. Um, and they are producing hydrogen now and they're off gassing and they have to basically release this gas so it doesn't, you know, explode. Um, hey, Josh. And, yeah. State of the art, supposedly today, is dry storage in casks and canisters. Right. But you're telling us at Hanford, it's still in tanks. That's right. Are those like cooling pools at a nuclear plant? And so there are, there's a lot of different cool. aspects at Hanford. Most of that waste is sitting in those tanks. Um, and some of those tanks, they have extracted uh, uh, strontium and, and, and cesium um, out of those uh, from the waste. And that is stored right now. These big, huge tubes are floating in like Olympic sized pools. Um, and that was one way to try to make these tanks safer. But in the, it, when they did this, of course, as, as we know with, with waste issues at this level, it's never really safe, right? So they've, they've put it in this, these pools to keep these big rods clean um, and they're just floating there. there there's a problem. Uh, that facility where these rods are, are floating around in this really highly radioactive waters uh, is on a fault line. So if there's an accident, if there's an, uh, you know, if it loses electricity, if there's um, any kind of seismic activity, you could see an explosion or some kind of re release just there. And that's not even talking about these tanks, right? So um, the waste that's in these tanks though, right now I would argue is posing the biggest problem um, for, for, the, for the cleanup. And uh, uh, what, what is the risk to say downstream from Portland down to Vancouver, Washington, Portland, Oregon? If one mm -hmm. of these were to rupture and drain into the Columbia, how much of a risk does that uh, portend? Well, we, we know, for instance, that during its operation, um, there were intentional releases of radiation, some of them for testing. Um, there were accidental releases, um, but constantly a lot of these um, bottom feeding fish were being monitored in the Columbia right near the Hanford site, as well as at the mouth of the Columbia River, which dumps into the Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, and this is the main river of the Pacific Northwest. I mean, this is where all this water is pouring out of, coming up from the, from the Rockies in Canada. Um, and they were finding fish that were radioactive at the mouth of the Columbia River. So this, the Columbia River, because of Hanford, is and was a radioactive river. It could be much, much worse if we see some kind of release. Um, and it would destroy the Pacific Northwest. I mean, there's Tens of thousands of Northwest farmers rely on, on waters from the Columbia. There are dozens of commercial fisheries along the Columbia River, um, you know, and not to mention who wants to live next to a river that's, you know, boasting high levels of, you know, radiation, right? Um, so that's one problem. Another problem is if you see, if there, we do see some kind of um, accident that releases uh, radioactive particles into the air, in the worst case scenario, a massive explosion, right? Uh, that waste is going to follow the jet stream and it's gonna spread across the United States. Um, Richland, which is adjacent to Hanford where most of the people that work at Hanford live. And, and Richland was born out of this whole project that didn't really exist before, before Hanford. Uh, it would be a place that you wouldn't wanna live. I mean, it would be a ghost town. Um, I think um, depending on, on wind currents, Boise, Idaho might not be a place people wanna live parts of Montana. I mean, a, and, and think about when Mount St. Helens erupted, right? There was ash that made its way all the way to the East Coast. Even the fires a few years ago, the massive fires up there, they were finding smoke was, you know, covering you know, Washington, DC. So uh, there's no reason to believe that, you know, <coughs> radiation wouldn't spread far and wide in the worst case scenario. So, so it's a really important issue to, for everybody to be kind of concerned about. So Josh, you've done, fabulous investigative journalism. Uh, are the various agencies that should be regulating this, including the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or the Department of Energy or the EPA, are they asleep at the switch or are they proactive, proactively trying to do something about this? Well, 
they are caught in a system that is a perpetual wheel of profits for these contractors. So I one of that whistleblower that I talked about earlier, Donald Alexander, and another one that I wrote a, a long piece about 10 years ago that's also included in the, in the book, Walter Tamasitis, who was a very high level, um, probably the biggest whistleblower in the last 20 years at Hanford. What they talk about is the uh, Department of Energy's lack of oversight. And it's not a lack of will, it's a lack of, of of personnel, it's a lack of funding on the DOE side. So you have these contractors that essentially run the show out there. Um, every aspect of the cleanup has to go through review process. Um, Bechtel, for instance, with this waste treatment plant, there's you know literally hundreds of different aspects to this project. Each one of those aspects has to go through a review process. Well, at the end of the day, the Department of Energy gets to green light it or not, right? Well, when they don't have the type, the right type um, amount of staffing to, to look at this stuff, the, the amount of you know technical staff, um, Bechtel can just push through bad ideas after bad idea, and obviously that's been the case, right? We haven't seen this stuff being cleaned up. Um, so I don't think it's a lack of expertise necessarily among those that actually work there, but it's a lack of of people in general, just just headcount, right? And it's the fact that Bechtel runs the show. Um, so that's, that's one of the big concerns that uh, under the Trump administration, just like the EPA was gutted, the Department of Energy was gutted, um, the funding being, you know, slashed. Meanwhile, the contracts keep, you know, ballooning. Um, so it's, it's a really, really big problem. And the whole system out there needs to change if we're going to see this get to a better place one day. So you think there actually are technical solutions of safely storing this waste? I think we all have to hope that there is. Um, I don't know if there's, an, there's not obviously an easy answer else this would have been done already. Um, just last fall, they had spent millions of dollars to, to build this facility that was gonna do you know, a test run for vitrification, for, for turning this into glass. They had a ribbon cutting, cutting ceremony. It was a big deal, right? Well, one week in, the thing overheated, and they had to go back to the drawing board. Um, and this is this is just one instance. I mean, it's case after case of this kind of of botched work. And I think that we all have to hope that it gets to a place where this stuff is stored safely. That we need to get this waste out of these tanks. Um, there are a lot of really, you know, I, I'm very obviously very critical of the cleanup operation in Bechtel in particular, and the Department of Energy. Um, hasn't always done a great job, obviously. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, we all want the same thing, right? Um, and I don't think anybody would say, hey, if it costs a trillion dollars to clean this up, let's spend it. You know, let's get this stuff so we don't have a, 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 a you know, horrible accident out there. However, if instead of that happening, it's just about profit motives, you know, getting paid not to get the job done as Walter Tamasitis has told me, um, that's a problem. It's a problem because we're paying for it. Taxpayers are paying for it. Now, Hanford is not the only nuclear waste storage site. There's 90 nuclear reactors that have uh, waste stored on site. Each of them has problems with erosion or earthquakes or terrorism uh, or whatever. And you hear people making the claim uh, that nuclear power is the solution to our climate crisis. Uh, wh right. What's your response to that? <laughs> well, even if we are supposed to, let, let's just for a minute believe hypothetically that everything that nuke boosters tell us is true, that everything about it, it's, it's safe, right? Which it isn't. Um, it doesn't have any carbon emissions in any part of the life cycle. If, if that were true, it isn't, but let's pretend that it is. If, if um, uranium mining is totally safe, let's pretend that that's true. It's not. Let's pretend that that's true. Um, you still have, and if waste, if there is an answer for the waste, right? There's not an answer for the waste, but let's pretend that there is. Even if all these things, let's just, let's just give, them, give them all of that it's still not going to be done in time, right? 
you can't roll out enough plants fast enough to impact the climate crisis. It's just not going to happen. Um, it's too expensive. It takes, you know, 10 to 15 years to get these, these things online. Uh, there's a big push for small modular reactors. Well, even those are very, very expensive. And um, there's a lot of questions about if they're going to get up and running in time. They're not. Um, so, I mean, I can, I can throw the kitchen sink at it, but yeah. it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, issues. But in relation to Hanford, for me personally, uh, the waste issue is something that just there is no answer for. Um, you, there is nothing, no, no place that you can put this stuff uh, for hundreds of thousands of years and keep it safe. If we're concerned about the future of the planet because of the climate, which we should, ought to be, we ought to be also uh, concerned about leaving a toxic legacy behind. Um, if we can save the climate with, with nuclear reactors, which we can't, you're, you're gonna create so much waste that you're gonna poison the planet anyway, right? So what, why, how can that possibly be a solution? Yeah. Um, you have a plant, you know, you, I think it's in Connecticut right now. They, they have waste that they've been trying to figure out what to do with for a long time. They just came up with this plan to store this stuff safely, right? It took them a long time to come up with this plan, lots and lots of money. And they are admit that it's only a temporary solution and that these facilities aren't gonna be ready for storage for 15 to 15 years. You, I mean, there's no answer for this stuff. Um, and that's a really, really big problem. That's what I take away from the Hanford mess is that um, any solution still comes with a lot of question marks. So uh, in terms of the climate crisis, uh, if we spent the amount of money that we would need to spend on nuclear to make a dent in it on um, things like wind and solar, uh, could we have a much quicker solution? Oh, certainly. Um, but that's not to say that those don't come with problems as well, as especially when we are, um, you know, this gets into a different type of conversation perhaps, you know, but we, we need to decentralize the grid. I think that uh, we, we, we can't let these companies um, put solar panels in, in you know, areas of pristine habitat. We need to be very concerned about the mining of minerals, you know, lithium mining and, and those sorts of things have really grave impacts. I mean, the thing that we really need to talk about really is degrowth. We need to talk about um, the fact that we've reached our limit with consumption in this country and the world, that we need to reassess and reevaluate um, our habits. Uh, you know, I'm very excited that we're going to get rid of combustion engines, right? I mean, in California, we're going to have EVs. Great. That's fantastic. But if we're replacing those with batteries um, and the mining of which is in Chile, in, you know, Brazil, in, in Bolivia, um, is causing environmental devastation in those communities, or even here in the Sierra Nevada or, or out in the Salton Sea in California, you know, you're, is, is that a good answer? I mean, we need to think about restructuring our cities. We need to think about uh, getting out there and making walkable communities, uh, bikeable communities, and really a restructuring of our whole society. Um, clearly, just, clearly, uh, a, a, clearly a circular economy where we recycle more and, and consume less is a great idea. But in terms of uh, uh, lithium production for batteries, uh, right here in Southern California, out in the Salton Sea, we have a very clean source of lithium. Uh, yeah. because doesn't require deep mining. It's uh, available in the waste product of a uh, energy plant out there that uh, is uh, a geothermal plant. And right. so there, and it could be a great prospect for uh, a, a renovation of the uh, economy out in a very impoverished area. So I yep. personally have optimism about gaining lithium from that. And I, I think disposal of batteries and such is a problem. But when it comes to climate change or it comes to nuclear waste, mm -hmm. that seems like a pretty small problem, doesn't it? I mean, at this point it does, but if you, you know, but for instance, just as you, and I, I don't necessarily disagree with you about the salt and sea, uh, there is a problem with how much water they're gonna have to use for that. Um, but meanwhile, they're opening up uh, perspective mining and, and, you know, in Thacker Pass, this very pristine habitat up in the Sierras. So, you know, it, it, it still is an extractive process. Um, and while we, the good thing is in this country, we do have very good regulations. 
they, they could be a lot better. Uh, but a lot of the places where they're sourcing this material, I mean, in South America, there's like, that's where two thirds of lithium is, is, is held. Right. And, and res reserves there and, and deposits yep. and, um, and copper as well, which is a huge, huge product and, and horrible mining goes in, you know, copper mining is, has horrible effects, especially open pit mining. Uh, so there's just a lot of these kind of things that we need to talk about as environmentalists sure. as well. Um, but going back to, to, to waste and nuclear waste, none of this poses the same long-term problems as, as storing or dealing with waste. Um, not only can it be, you know, leaking, underground leaking and getting into groundwater supplies, you can also be using this stuff in, in, a, in a dirty bomb. You know, and, and what is the global landscape going to look like in 20 years, 100 years, let alone, you know, 10,000 years, um, if this stuff can that, you know, be re-refined and used in atomic bombs, um, which it can. I mean, once it goes through the, the fission process in a reactor for energy, it doesn't have that much further to go to be made into a, a bomb. Um, so you're almost, you know, you're doing all the legwork for these places. So um, it's, it, that's, a, that's a big concern of mine as well. Okay, for those that are just joining us, uh, our guest today is Joshua Frank. Uh, he is a uh, award-winning journalist and uh, also uh, has graduate degrees in environmental conservation. So we think he probably knows what he's talking about here. He has just written a fabulous book called Atomic Days, The Untold Story of the Most Toxic Place in America, which is the Hanford nuclear site in Western Washington. Bart is holding up a copy of the book. I urge you to pick it up. It's a fabulous uh, piece of journalism. And it is journalists that often are the uh, whistleblowers and the watchdogs over private companies and government agencies that are really not doing the job they need to. So I'm going to turn it over to Bart. Bart, do you have a question or do we have any other listeners that uh, are potentially asking questions now? Yeah, let me see. Let me see. Q&A. We have a couple of questions. Um, uh, I'll, I'll start with an anonymous attendee. Has the Hanford site impacted nearby communities and what are some of the long term effects, which is what you already sort of addressed? And I'm thinking, have they measured radioactivity in the wine yet? Have they is, is there monitoring on the river? in continuous manner so that people can know when it spikes up or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a second, but I think it's um, really important to understand how radioactive materials accumulate in the body, right? So it, it, it bioaccumulates in your muscles and in your tissues and in your bones. Um, over time, the more that you're exposed, you're, the greater your risk of developing a myriad of different types of cancers, other types of, types of illnesses. Um, during the operation of Hanford, uh, as I mentioned before, there was intentional release, releases of radioactive materials. The big, big one that we know about was called the Green Run, where they uh, intentionally released iodine-131 into the air. Um, there's, there's still um, a lot of debate about the real intention of why they did this, but ultimately it was for testing purposes. Now, whether or not it was to test it as a, as a chemical, you know, a weapon, or if it was to, to test um, its impact on people, um, we don't really know. But um, this release was a huge mess, obviously. Um, and the, the downwind communities were completely unaware that this was happening. Um, we know from some of those, um, at least anecdotal um, studies and, and qualitative, you know, research has shown that the communities that were impacted by this, uh, the Green Run, and then also just living in the, you know, in the vicinity of Hanford had high levels of thyroid cancers and, and rheumatoid arthritis, especially among the Yakima Nation, uh, indigenous peoples that lived very close by. Um, so, you know, the government hasn't gone in and done the really long, long longitudinal studies. And one of the, some of the problem is like a lot of this stuff, the people from, you know, back in the sixties, a lot of those people that were exposed are no longer around. So that's, that's a big problem um, as far as research goes. And of course the government doesn't want to admit any of this stuff. I mean, 
the information about the green run, this didn't even come out until the 80s. We didn't really know about it. Uh, and that wasn't the only intentional release. Um, there, and then of course we have all these accidental releases as well. Um, and those are the accidents, right? That's not even just talking about living around something like this. Um, today they do monitor, uh, but they monitor mostly on site um, and it's for safety purposes for the workers. Um, there are thousands of workers out there that are working in uh, the most dangerous jobs we have in this country, I would argue, or, or, or right up there. I mean, they're working around in, in facilities that are radioactive. Um, uh, they're exposed consistently to chemical vapors. Um, there were, you know, hundreds of millions of gallons of chemical vapors were produced or uh, chemical products were produced that were dumped literally into the soil out there. So we have that problem. Um, but no, uh, there isn't consistent testing of radioactive uh, soil contamination in and around the region that there should be. Um, you have that the central Washington area and then also over into Idaho, huge agricultural region, uh, not just wine. Obviously wine is, is, is one that I'm probably most, most fond of, but um, they're, they're not testing the wine. Um, and it's a problem, right? I think if, if we had more of an awareness uh, we, we would know that this is still around. I mean, cesium, for example, that was released into the environment, it grows up in, in these plants, right? It's, it's in plants on the Hanford Reservation that are being eaten by coyotes. Uh, the coyotes and, and the deer on, on, the, on the reservation uh, have shown high levels of radioactivity. Um, maybe they're not as high as you know, the dogs around Chernobyl, but they're still pr it's pretty high. So what, what is that exposure for people in the region? But there's a lot of denialism as well. Um, and then there's this a fervent patriotism that runs through the culture of Richland. It's a very conservative um, town, but it boasts the, the, the most PhDs per capita in the entire country. And so it's a very educated town, uh, but it's, it's bizarre. Um, it is kind of a bizarre place to go and spend time in the, uh, the, the high school mascot is the bombers. Um, they, they celebrate the, the atomic age uh, and, and they really believe, um, especially, especially the older generation that no matter how bad Hanford is now, it was worth it because it ended World War II. Uh, it, it produced one of the, uh, the fuel for the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. So they, they still believe, even though of course we can get into all of that, if that was even necessary, it wasn't of course. And um, there's no, you know, memorial for the Japanese that perished. Um, there is still this, uh, it it's almost runs like a covert military town today or a military town today, because it is in many ways still a covert military operation. It's now a cleanup, but it was shrouded in secrecy for so long that that has carried over into the culture today. So it's a really a bizarre, a bizarre thing. But to go back to the, your question, I think because of that, sort of cultural apathy to the potential dangers, there isn't an appetite to test and to be concerned about exposure, right? Uh, because that would really challenge their whole worldview in a way. These, these nuclear issues turn up again and again at Santa Susana and at Hanford and at Rocky Flats and at nuclear plants throughout the United States. And hypothesize with me, which is the problem here? Is it ignorance on the part of government officials? Is it collusion on the part of uh, uh, political officials? Is it uh, too controversial to touch or some of all of those? You're talking about just the- I'm talking about- the atomic the, project the, in general? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, at the government level to really address this stuff would to to address American supremacy, right? I mean, it, the Cold War was propped up by nuclear powers and, and that arsenal still, even though it was cut, you know, in the, in the 80s, um, it's still very large today. Uh, we have a potential confrontation with Russia and NATO, um, not to mention the risks of Zaporizhia and depleted uranium that it's gonna be shipped from Britain. Um, so, so all of these um, issues, I think 
um, benefit uh, Western supremacy because they are propped up by our nuclear arsenal. So to challenge this stuff is to challenge that, right? Um, and then I think at a very basic level, there is a lot of ignorance and there is a lot of um, uh, control of the information by those that want to, to prop this up. Um, but on a, on a, you know, scaling back a little bit on the energy issue, I do like to give people the benefit of the doubt. I mean, we can go back to what we were talking about with, with atomic energy as an answer, potential answer for climate change. You know, I think a lot of people, especially younger generation are captivated by the idea that this, there's a technical solution to this problem, that there's just, let's make these plants, let's get them up and running and, and get rid of coal and natural gas. And this is great, right? This is, sounds like something out of the Jetsons, like the future is right here and we've had this technology all along. Why aren't we utilizing it? Um, so I think that that's captivating for people because they're rightfully scared about climate change. However, they don't know <laughs> all of the history of, of the anti-nuke movement, um, of what they accomplished. They don't truly understand the risks. They don't really understand what happened to Chernobyl. Uh, we have cover-ups after cover-up with Fukushima. Um, and you fast forward to, to Ukraine. I mean, um, there are just so many problems. And that goes to, I think, the fact that uh, nuclear energy and weapons and all, it, it is, it's very, in, very complicated stuff when it gets down to, and, and on, the, on the scientific level, it's a lot easier to understand, you know, even a combustion engine, but what happened? What is fission? Like, what is fusion? How does this work? What is waste? What do you mean there's waste? I thought there was, you know, it's a, there's a lot of components to it that I think um, uh, a lot of people aren't aware of, right? And of course the, the boosters don't wanna talk about waste, you know? So if you read, I know there was a, an op-ed in the New York Times last week of, of this, you know, somebody, I think it's called the, uh, the Green um, Nuclear Energy Deal, Green New Deal, Nuclear Energy, whatever, something crazy. And it's just completely full of propaganda. Oliver Stone just has released a new documentary um, and about you know, talking about how great new energy is. <laughs> completely, completely bonkers stuff. And he, he's at least honest that he, he's like, I don't, I'm not, I put no critics in my, you're not gonna hear any of the dissenting voices in my film about this, right? Uh, so it's pure propaganda, but that's a lot of people eat that up because- <laughs> Josh, uh, would you just say that the reasons that, that we have problems right now with the development of, of nuclear energy is that, number one, it's uneconomic to date, right? Yeah, It doesn't certainly. compare with what Lazard said a year or two ago, that, that solar, wind, and batteries are, are three or four times cheaper, right? Fourfold cheaper. And also, there's no way that nuclear energy could be deployed in, in 2035 in time for the... Uh, for the global warming to really kick in in a serious manner. So that we, mm -hmm. I mean, and we have 10 years to solve the problem and you put up a solar farm or a wind wind farm in a couple of years, right? So, if we're, and the other thing is we still don't know what to do with the waste. I'm open for mm -hmm. nuclear energy and fission and fusion to happen, but it doesn't look like they, we just need more research, I guess. But, to, but for a solution oriented, what, I mean, look, you're talking about, 584 square miles. I mean, you talk about this would be some of the biggest solar. I mean, there's not a lot of wind there, but I'm sure. I mean, a lot of sun, but there's a lot of wind. What do you think could be a solution to provide enough energy to help transform Hanford from the most uh, toxic place in America, probably rating in the world, to something that can be cleaned up while they produce? clean green energy is that what do you think <laughs> i like i like your visionary idea um you know there's a lot of you know the the site itself is is so radioactive um but with that said there still is a lot of biodiversity in the land right once once humans are removed from a landscape animals and plants flourish and I would be skeptical of just covering it all with solar panels. I don't know if that's a good solution. I don't know if it's a safe solution, honestly. Um, I wish there was an easy solution. I know one thing that is a fact is that we have a lot of 
buildings in Southern California and all over the coast that could have solar panels. Um, I don't think that we need to um, essentially pave over the wild uh, regions, uh, in, especially in the West, because that's where they exist the most to, to, to solve the climate crisis. I think we, we need to work about on, on efficiency. I think we need to descale. I think that we need to make it easier for people to put solar panels on their roofs. I mean, the Governor Newsom's done quite the opposite um, and made it harder. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of solutions I think that can have a minimal impact, and those those would be the ones that I'd be the most interested in. Um, as far as Hanford, you know, Hanford was never producing energy, right? Um, it was producing fuel for bombs, um, and I get this question a lot. Well, isn't that different than producing energy? I mean, it's a completely different thing. No, actually, it's really not. Um, plutonium is a byproduct of the fission process, right? So whether you're producing energy or you're producing it for fuel purposes, it's still being produced through the fission process. It's being produced in all reactors in the world today and in all reactors in the future, small modular reactors, anything else, still produces plutonium. Um, the ones at Hanford were extra refined so that it was you know, better for, for fuel for a bomb, but they all produce this stuff and it's all gonna be around for 250,000 years. It's, it's crazy. Just, you know, I think that sometimes numbers sort of like cloud reality and we get start, you know, they just kind of like, go, you know, get washed over us and we don't really think about what does that really mean? Well, to put it in perspective, you know, humans have only been roaming outside of Africa for like 60,000 years. And think of all the societies that have risen and fallen and crumbled and um, that's only 60,000 years. Plutonium, if it had been around then would still be you know, radioactive for another 190,000 years from now, right? So it's, it's crazy, crazy stuff. I, and I think from a human perspective, a very human perspective in, in our great energy revolution that is happening now, I think we need to really look at who profits from this. I think that we really need to be advocates for the least impactful solutions possible. And I think that we need to um, come together and oppose the, the most horrific of those ideas. And one of those is atomic energy. Um, atomic energy has no place in any green portfolio for our future whatsoever. Well spoken, Josh. I, I just, oh, Steve, Peter, were you going to say something? Well, I was just going to say, I was a co-author along with 12 others of the National Sierra Club uh, uh, guidance on uh, nuclear waste. And I would concur uh, exactly with what you say. The risks are monumental. And with regard just to uh, uh, nuclear sites that generate energy, we've got 90 of those around the country, all stored with nuclear waste, either in cooling pools or in dry storage right. that are vulnerable to earthquakes, tsunamis, climate change, sea rise, terrorism, I could go on and on with that list, Yeah, but they're very vulnerable. The odds of all of them surviving, even our remaining lifetimes are not great. So I would completely concur based on our extensive research at Sierra Club uh, with what you're saying. Well, thanks so much for your research. And I have, I've, I've, sourced, I've sourced it quite a few times in different, different projects yeah. I've worked on. Um, you know, I, I think this conversation changes a lot too if we were to see a disaster at Zaporizhia tomorrow. I yep. mean, again, if even if all of the, the propaganda that they throw at us is true, listen, the, the, the matter of fact is atomic energy plants in the war zone pose great, great risks. Terrible. And, you know, Taiwan is, it might be the next frontier for uh, some kind of conflict. They have nuke plants. How are... This is a whole new tool of war now, um, and, and Russia is using it to their advantage to control and potentially, you know, take that region. Um, but what are the impacts? And if there is an accident, if and it doesn't have to be that one of these plants gets hit with, a, you know, a projectile. It could be that they lose power and their backup generator fails. And I've written about the potential for these, these really old school Soviet diesel generators that aren't that efficient that could poop out. And then what? Then you have a meltdown. 
then you basically have what happened at Fukushima. Um, of course, Russia knows this because they're going to get a lot of the, the radioactive fallout from that kind of accident. Um, but it, th these are grave risks. I mean, nuke plants in general are grave, grave risks. The Diablo plant up the coast from us, extension of that life was one of the greatest failures of the Gavin Newsom administration, in my view. Absolutely. And if, if tomorrow there's an earthquake and we see something horrific happen in San Luis Obispo and off the coast and spreads to the central, central California and across the country, um, our it, it changes again, right? Um, We're a little I, different than any presidential aspirations. Huh? Absolutely. And if you go back even to all of the great things that the anti-nuke movement accomplished in this country and putting the brakes on essentially the entire uh, plan to build hundreds of nukes across the country, they were also aided by the disaster of Chernobyl. Um, and I fear that I, I, I don't want to see that happen. I don't want to see a, an accident happen and that be the reason why more people come on our side. Um, yeah. I really don't. I, I, you know, same with Hanford. I would probably be on you know, CNN tomorrow, if there's a big accident out there, and I don't want to be, I'd rather not be. <laughs> Josh, speaking of um, accidents waiting to happen, I'm talking to you about 30 miles, 35 miles from a place called San Onofre. And there's a whole group of, of people down here working on that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's even outreach from Mothers for Peace who have their own problem with Diablo Canyon restarting. But right. there's, you know, San Clemente Green and public watchdogs and uh, there's just there's a lot of people trying to deal with that. Let me get some some qu questions from the audience about containment. There's a there's a, a masterful woman named Donna Gilmore who's about the the containers that are the warranty have a 25 year warranty. They're five ace thin stainless steel. How do those containers compare to the single wall containers at Hanford? Um, well, they're a lot newer. <laughs> That's one of the problems. I mean, and also one of the biggest problems with the Hanford tanks is that the stuff in these tanks and each one of these tanks is different. So it's not only the radioactive stuff that's eating away at the bottoms of these tanks. It's all the chemical waste as well. Oh, so see you have, you have, a, a, you know, just the leaching problem in these tanks varies from tank to tank. So whereas the, these new tanks that she, that she's talking about, um, they're obviously uh, made, I would say they're probably made better. Um, they still have their problems, uh, but the ones at Hanford are literally sitting in soil that it's been sitting in now for since the you know, 50s and they're corroding. I mean, the bottoms of these single shell tanks are corroding. That's why they started making the double shell tanks, but that wasn't until the 70s. They were just had these single shell tanks and they are creating so much waste when they're making plutonium that these tanks were literally like overflowing into the one. So when one and fill up, it'd fill up the next one and fill up the next one and fill up the next one. It was just constantly overflowing basically. And today we're just dealing with the aftermath of that. So um, we have, we've learned nothing sort of, I mean, what, what has San Onofre learned? What has Diablo Canyon learned from, from Hanford? That's a good question. Um, I think what we've learned from the outside is that this stuff poses really, really grave risks to us all. I, you know, San O is one of my favorite places to surf. And, you know, I'm, I'm paddling out at Old Man's and you look up at the, you know, the plant and I worry, you know, did they just flush water out of that thing? I don't know. You know, I'm just, just hope for the best. Um, it's, yep. uh, it's a problem, but imagine if, if, if the pro nuke folks had their way, we'd have these plants up and down the coast. We'd have them along rivers. Um, but I would remind, I'm sure we're in, friend, on, in friendly territory now, but when these conversations come up, remind people, look, look at what happened to France last summer. France basically took, so France is, is looked at as like the, the ideal nuclear powered you know, country in the world. Well, last summer they had to take half their plants offline during an enormous heat wave. Um, and why? Well, some of them were corroding, so they had to take those offline because they were, weren't safe. But a lot of them were taken offline because the rivers that they were drawing water from were too warm and too low to cool the reactors down. So you're going to make plants to combat climate change, yet climate change is going to heat the rivers so you can't use the reactors. 
<laughs> it's like it's 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 like scientific you know it's like science fiction stuff it's crazy um, so with with regard to the water off san onofre uh, yeah bart and uh the the coalition for nuclear safety has documented dozens of liquid batch releases from san onofre uh into the pacific ocean under the theory that dilution is the solution right. uh, and and so that that is one issue but the the other issue is that uh, there is uh, not a long-term solution for storage. As Bart has said, at San Onofre and at other nuclear power plants throughout the country, uh, these thin-walled casks do not last forever, especially right. in marine environments subject to corrosion and, uh, and uh, wind and such. Uh, and, then, and then finally, uh, uh, the threat of, of terrorism is omnipresent with all of these uh, nuclear sites. We think San Onofre is guarded well, but in all the guard houses, you don't know if they're occupied or not. And that's yeah. well, presented. I think about I think about that with Hanford. Um, yeah. And I've thought about it for a long sure. time with Hanford, even though it's very secure. I mean, what was it just a few months ago? We had those crazy, the crazy uh, Chinese weather balloons, right? Or the, the, the balloons that came over. Right. And I think well, what if something, what if a drone went in there and attacked one of these tanks? Then what happens? Yep. You know, it, there's just so many different scenarios for stuff to go wrong with this. I mean, no other energy source poses these kind of risks. And risk management requires uh, understanding the worst case scenarios, not That's right. panaceas and, and, uh, and uh, BS. But if you're if we were to listen to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about all of the risks, I mean, they say something like there's a one in whatever 154 chance that a plant's going to have a meltdown. Well, we've already had how many meltdowns since we started this whole project in this for human society? We've had like five, if you include, you know, each reactor that melted down at Fukushima. Um, so what does that mean for the future? And what did we learn from this? We certainly didn't learn much. I'm really concerned right now about India. Um, and, they're, and they have horrible, horrible regulations, um, which has actually made nuke energy cheaper than other stuff like solar, for instance, per kilowatt hour. And the reason is because they don't have really any strict regulations whatsoever. There's a reason why we don't drive cars made in India in this country. They don't all have any of the, you know, some of them don't have seatbelts. Some of them don't have, uh, you know, airbags. Um, so being in, you know, constructing new plants under these kind of scenarios um, is really frightening stuff, really frightening stuff. And it doesn't uh, solve the climate crisis. Josh, I, we have, let me, let me integrate some of the audience. And there's some fantastic questions coming, coming in. Um, and, and some that, you, that you've that you've already answered, like in your research, did you come across any evidence of efforts to cover up the dangers posed by the Hanford site or downplay the severity of the environmental uh, contamination? Do you have a quick answer for that one that you haven't already shared with us? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, well, yes, there was. So in the 80s, Hanford, late 80s, Hanford and early 90s, Hanford was being considered a uh, as a, a site that they wanted to send more waste to. Um, even though they already had all this waste, I think that they were kind of like, well, it's already so bad, let's just keep shoveling stuff over there, right? Well, the local um, Yakima nation um, basically was like, wait a second, hold on. We're, we're right here. We, you, you don't, you're not gonna come through our lands to come and drive through and dump this stuff. Um, one um, advocate, Russell Jim, um, who I write, I have a chapter dedicated to him in the book, who was a, a wonderful man. He died maybe five years ago now, and I had the chance of meeting him and interviewing him. Um, he almost single-handedly is the reason why we know about the Green Run and all these other accidents and events that happened out there. Um, when he was fighting to stop um, Hand for becoming a more, you know, a, a garbage bin for more waste. He was out in Washington lobbying. He stopped, he spoke on Capitol Hill and he essentially uh, stopped Hanford along with other advocates from becoming a, a future waste depository. 
Um, unfortunately, that waste went to Rocky Flats and elsewhere, but it stopped Hanford for the moment. But because of that, and because of a lot of lawsuits and a, a lot of the um, accountability that came out of his efforts, we learned about a lot of this stuff, a lot of these cover-ups. Uh, but it wasn't until the 80s that we learned about this in the late in the 90s when tens of thousands of documents were released. Um, and under the Clinton administration, um, even more were released. But it, the floodgates opened because of Russell Jim. So I think it's important, you know, a lot of this stuff gets like, it's pretty dire. You know, you can get angry, you can get frustrated, you can get concerned. But there are a lot of people that are um, fighting the good fight up there just like here in California, the work that you all are doing. Um, the Columbia Riverkeeper is a great organization up there that's doing great work and trying to hold these, these agencies and these contractors feet to the fire. You have uh, Hanford Challenge up in Seattle um, that is helping and protecting whistleblowers and, and trying to draw attention to this issue. So there are a lot of local organizations and not to mention the continued efforts of the Yakima Nation that are, are, are really, um, embody the spirit of Russell Jim today and are still really concerned. And, and there are, there's no major decisions that can happen out at Hanford without a seat at the table for indigenous tribes. Good. Um, so that means that they won't take the San Onofre nuclear waste. That's uh, correct. Three and a half million, 3.6, 3.55 million pounds and put it on a barge and truck it up the, up the Columbia to, to your dump site. Yeah. Which is good. And that's the, yeah. it reminds me of um, Ken Cook with the Environmental Working Group, how they helped shut down um, uh, Yucca Mountain was also because they did a, a study study groups in Salt Lake City and said, do you want to have the, a repository for nuclear waste? And everyone said, absolutely, we do. And then, then they said, do you want to have thousands of truckloads of nuclear waste running you know, within 50 miles of your community? And, and that's when Yucca Mountain was, was successfully closed. Um, I have another question from Nathan Bhutan. Can you expand on the closed cultural loop that exists within those circles of highly educated nuclear physicists? Do those scientists think that they can be the one to solve the problem, whether that be the cleanup, global warming, et cetera? And how does that hubris translate to today's billionaires now investing in nuclear energy? Mm. Which reminds me of the... 321, 231 million dollars that New York Times article I can't seem to find, but about two two years ago, February, that that Bill Gates was starting a. I mean, he's done so much good, but he's also involved with public relations for his um, nuclear power investment with the small modular mm -hmm. nuclear reactors. Well, you want to you want to talk about the cultural loop at all? Yeah, it's, I mean that's a complicated question. Um, first, I would say that not all highly educated scientists and engineers that um, even um, nuclear or fit and physicists are on board with atomic energy and atomic waste. A lot understand the dangers. Um, they're not all Arnie Gundersons that are whistleblowers and came, came around. Um, some of them are, um, but th there is a divide, I think, in the scientific community um, on this stuff. Uh, those, however, that are working in plants, um, those that are uh, working on, you know, new advanced technologies like fusion, I do believe that some of them believe the bullshit that they are spoon fed in, in schools. And um, I think that they believe that there are technical solutions to the problems that we're facing that we can continue to live uh, the comfort um, in our capitalistic societies without there being any ramifications. And that's a big problem because it doesn't, it's not true. I mean, resources are scarce. Um, uh, uranium is scarce. <laughs> Metals for, for you know, green technologies in some cases are very scarce. Uh, so there aren't those kind of, kind of solutions. But I think that a scientific mind um, sometimes fails to grasp the socio and economic realities that we face and the, the other factors that, that play into all of this, whether they're geopolitical or whether they're, uh, uh, you know, about waste, you know, they would much rather talk about trying to find a solution for atomic waste than to talk about the dangers of it, right, for instance. So 
it's a it's a it's a change in perspective that's needed um, because there are a lot of brilliant people that we need on our side to help us figure out what to do with the problems we've already created. And a lot of them are working on that. Um, but we need to do that and not create a whole new slew of problems as well. So there's a cultural divide within the scientific community as well. But there's great organizations, one like Science for the People is a really great organization and has a lot of smart, intelligent uh, scientists that, you know, and this isn't to say the, Uni the Union for Concerned Scientists and lots of others that are really concerned about this stuff. So okay. um, it's not all that are pro-nuke, that's for sure. That's, you know, I mean, and then there's another question about what about the people who do not own their homes, who can't cover the rooftops and solar? What should lower income in citizens and families do to play their part to saving our planet? So I think mm -hmm. since it's, it's, it's a little over an hour, help me with this one, Peter. Let's end on a, like a positive note. Let's see what we can do to come up with, with knowing what we have. It's very important to know. And then the second thing would be what's, what solutions can we offer people? How do they go about attending to the awareness that you've just shared? Well, in, in terms of uh, solar in, in disadvantaged communities or, or highly dense communities, uh, we have to have uh, community solar projects which build solar uh, collectors in over parking lots and on vacant land and over canals that bring water uh, across California, which will both conserve water and generate power simultaneously. So these are possibilities. We also need both government and private agencies to fund, fund uh, greenhouse uh, gas uh, reduction programs as uh, the Sierra Club is attempting to do through the San Diego Foundation, which gives people grants uh, to, you know, especially in communities of concern, to uh, do things like retrofit their homes and to build solar or to get gas out of their homes and put in heat pumps and uh, uh, electric water heaters. So uh, there's a plethora of solutions. We're not out of ideas. And uh, uh, it's been a great conversation today. Uh, I wanna put in one last plug for uh, Joshua and his book. Uh, his book is Atomic Days, the untold story of the most toxic uh, place in America, uh, the story of the Hanford nuclear site in Western Washington. And on behalf of uh, uh, Samuel Lawrence Foundation and Josh and I wanna thank you, Joshua, for being with us today and sharing your expertise. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, just one, one last thing I would add to answer, to, to, to add on to what you're saying about, you know, what we can do. Um, Let's just remember that the biggest polluters in this world are billionaires. And let's also remember that the biggest single polluter in, in the world is the US military. So uh, if we want to really look at the bigger problem, let's, let's not blame individuals that nope. um, are just trying to get by too, right? Um, we do need those solar projects. We do need those things to happen. But the, the big, big polluters in this country are, 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 are not you know, most of the renters of the world. Um, true. Josh, this is just the beginning of a conversation because I can see uh, a lot more information sharing this way. Our, I think our job as foundation is to just bring awareness to the problem most people don't, don't know about. And thanks to you and thanks to Peter and thanks to a whole slew of, of, of the, the partners that we have in this, um, uh, all the partners that decided to, to support this recording. I, we're going to do this again. Thanks a lot. Thank you very, very much. Very honored to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Enjoy your weekends, everybody. Thank you.